Welcome. Yeah. Hello and welcome. We are having a round of lightning talks, four talks after one each other. We are starting with a shorter, faster way to performance, making the case run in shorter than 12 parsecs with fast in Drupal 8. I'm Fabian Franz and this is Doc Velko. And here we start. <laughs> uh, this is us. Uh, this talk got condensed down from uh, 45 minutes to an hour to 15 minutes, so that's why we're going to be rushing through a little. We cut a lot of stuff, but it's still, uh, still got a lot of slides to go through. So this is us. Um, let's talk about Varnish real quick first, though. So Varnish is a, a HTTP reverse proxy cache, um, which ba breaks down in three things. HTTP, we all know. We love it, we use it, et cetera. Um, but the reverse proxy is, it, it means that it sits in front of a web server. And the cache part is, I, want, I hope you guys are all familiar with that, is new um, to Drupal 8 uh, with the, the full page cache internally. Um, varnish is like that. Why do people use it? It's, it's fast, it's flexible. It allows you to do uh, certain things like this. Uh, this is a really uh, quick thing. If the, the URL of the request starts with slash search, then lowercase it. That's, it's just a little programming language uh, that you have to configure uh, Varnish called VCL, the Varnish configuration language. And it allows you to do a whole lot of simple things like this, or slightly more complex things like this. This is uh, to deal with uh, origin and cores and all that sort of thing. It looks at what the origin is, saves it, um, looks at what it is, and then depending on whether or not you know, it's the right origin, it sets uh, the course headers, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a, a quick um, you know, uh, example of what, what the power of ECL can do for you. The advantage of this, uh, Paul Hennigkamp, by the way, is the uh, original author of Varnish, and he still runs the project. It's sort of like a printing press for books, but for websites. So th the main problem with Drupal uh, performance and, and the reason why the uh, page cache was introduced in Drupal 8 is that if you have to rebuild the page every time, you have to bootstrap, it takes a lot of time. Uh, was it 100 plus milliseconds? just for you know, a single request. So if you don't have to do that, if you don't have to like, write a page of every book by hand, but you can just print it much faster. So that's what Varnish does for websites. The problem is, though, however, if you go global, say you have a newspaper instead of a, uh, uh, a book, you have to start doing this. You have to start shipping your newspapers all over the world. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it delays the newspaper getting to other countries. So, you know, not ideal. Instead of an airplane, though, you could also use one of these. Um, who's familiar with this ship? <laughs> it's, it's, the, uh, it's the Millennium Falcon. Don't you know it did the, the, the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs? Bunch of junk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the thing is, though, uh, Lucas got a little flack for this because parsec is a uh, unit of distance, not time, etc. And then he went on to explain on the Blu-ray, like, oh, no, 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 no. The thing is, Han Solo was a smuggler, and the Kessel Run was, you know, not a straight line, and you could take shortcuts. And he did it with a really dangerous shortcut, and that's why it was less than 12 parsecs. Shortcuts. Very important. That's actually, you know, the problem with, with web performance uh, on a global scale is that we're bound by the speed of light. This thing wasn't, but we are. The speed of light through fiber around the world. So you can't really cut down latency with any sort of trick other than making the path shorter. Well, that's what we did at Fastly. We put the printing presses all around the world. So Drupal 8 has a built-in page cache, fun. We have caches all around the world that you can then link to Drupal. Fabian's gonna get into the details of that. Um, we have some more features, uh, but the key one is key-based purging. I'm gonna <coughs> go into that real quick. Um, basically what you do is if you uh, send a response from your origin server to the CDN, uh, you can put a header in there with keys, circuit keys, and those objects that we have in our cache are then tagged with those keys. You do then a purge command, 
based on that key. All objects, no matter what object it is, if it has that key on it, it's perched. Looks a little like this. Um, this is the headers of two different uh, responses. They're both the same article. I just grabbed some, some random values. You can see the article ID here, but they have two different templates. Now normally if they have different URLs, like one could be for mobile, one could be uh, the regular site, so you know, m.example.com and www.example.com. And then you would have to, if you wanted to perch them both, you would normally have to send two perch commands, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just send one perch for the article in 1938, both are wiped from the cache and the users then request that page, fresh copy is grabbed from the origin. However, if you make a change to the template of the mobile site, in this case, all you have to do is purge template three, boom. Everything related to that template is gone from all the caches globally, you're done. So, um, but what about Drupal? Um, in Drupal, um, what we have to do in Drupal 7, our support was pretty basic and Fastly mostly works for the expire uh, module in uh, expiring that. And then Dries made this blog post and, um, to making Drupal 8 fly, which is, I'd really have been trying to do, women, me, to really make Drupal so fast. Um, where we have this much more precise cache invalidation using cache tags, which is the same as surrogate keys. So, and we have this cache tags, and because they are surrogate keys, the Fastly module kind of only has to do, and that's why we can remove so much stuff when it was ported to Drupal 8, it really only has to support those translation from cache keys to surrogate keys and shortening them a little because Fastly has a header limit of 16 KB. And we are done. So this is now one of the most simple, easy modules, putting your API key, getting for a quick dashboard, but in reality, it's one even subscriber and you're done. Okay, so we have very good phishing support and the Fastly plugins and it synergizes incredibly well. But there's more in that supporting cache cons. I'm gonna go a little more into the detail there. and. So the common scenario we usually have is we have a web server, we have Varnish, we have a web server, and it's happy because it doesn't get much load on it. And with the CDN, it looks a little different because we have, again, two happy web servers, a Varnish, and we have all those CDNs around the world which take the majority of the traffic. But then one day, someone had a very, very bad idea. They put a product into a shopping cart. And then this looked like this. <laughs> The site is slow, the web server runs away screaming, and is really unhappy. So that's not a good thing. So my solution I've been working on uh, together with BigPipe and the other thing, this is kind of the other side of the Drupal caching system, is, is a 8x prototype I've uh, done. Um, and the idea is we can authenticate the user within Varnish. We can store a mapping of their session ID in the cache context. Uh, because we have a cache hierarchy, and then we are gonna have a heavy web server, obviously. So that sounds pretty complicated, but overall it's not too much, because the nice thing is because Drupal 8 was designed in a special, special way, there will be just one VCL file to rule them all for all authenticated user caching. Kinda no configuration needed, plug in, be happy. Out of the box in Drupal 8, and obviously will work with Fastly too. Um, so the vision here is to really be able to run 80 to 90% of the read-only authenticated traffic completely from Varnish and the CDN too. Um, so how does it work in a little more detail? Um, we have like the shopping cart and it's user cached and we have a normal block which is per permissions and the main page content which is obviously URL cached. And then what we're doing is we're just putting a placeholder in. And um, while in Drupal, we are putting that very late in that. Um, here we are putting an ESI placeholder. Then we are putting uh, cache tags, max age, when to invalidate, um, that we have all available as information. We have the cache context, what to vary on, which is very similar to the HTTP header and the very and the example very accept. 
and placeholders make all of that possible, and Drupal has auto placeholding, which means it can detect what can't be cached, it can detect what's high frequency cache context, and it can automatically ESI those as well. And we also have those lazy builders. So one static VCL for our cases, enable ESI module, combine those placeholder strategies strategically. The web server is happy, we are happy too. Here's some resources for you, and remember, as fast in Drupal 8, you can also make the castle run in less than 12 parsec today. So, questions? We have one question. Give some mic if someone wants. At the end? Okay, we have a few more. Uh, we had this, but apparently there can be more than one. Good questions now. <laughs> deep, 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 deep. <laughs> All right. Okay, if there's no questions, then I think we continue to the next session. Screen like uh, this. Yeah. Oh, view. Do you have enter full screen mode? Yeah. Try. Oh yeah. yeah. It's fine. Cool. All right. All right. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about the largest Drupal 8 websites on Earth and uh, how you also can do it. I'm not the one who said that the website I'm going to talk about are actually the largest. Uh, the one who said that, I think you, uh, you have all heard about the guy, he said that Le Temps, who, which is a, a Swiss media news website, probably is the largest website built with Drupal 8. This is this website you can check online. Uh, pretty big website in the, in the Swiss, uh, Switzerland. Uh, but I'm also going to talk about another website which is called Swedoschweiz, built by another company, which is also a very big website in the news industry in Switzerland, and another one called Willy Sarboto, also in Switzerland. Why am I talking about those three websites? Because those three websites have a very uh, strong particularity. What makes them so special? They have all been launched before Drupal 8 was actually released. So those major, huge websites have all been built and launched before Drupal 8 was released, as a stable release. That makes it pretty cool. But also they are built out of the same distribution, the NPA distribution. And they are also all hosted on platform.sh, which is a hosting solution that I'm working with. How the hell did that happen? I mean, you have three competitors, big competitors in the, in the same country, doing the same, same thing, in the, working in the same industry, and they, are all, they all launched their website with Drupal 8, they all launched their website before Drupal 8 was released, and uh, I mean, and they are also all using the same distribution for building their website. And the only solution that was available for them was actually to work together to solve the same issues they were all having. They all have the same issue, they all need uh, to fix the same problem and to answer the same questions, so they decided to actually work together to resolve those problems. And that's how NP8 came out. NP8 is a Drupal 8 distribution that I'm going to really present now. And the two actual founders of that distribution was a company called SoMedia, very big, big um, media agency, uh, and uh, Gasman Media. So um, I think SoMedia is uh, behind Swedoschweiz, but they have a lot of websites that they are all migrating using that distribution. And Gas Media built uh, the, the, the third one that I presented, Willis Our Butter, and they are also all migrating all their websites with Drupal 8 with that distribution. And who built that distribution? It's a company in Switzerland called MD System that you might have heard about. So you have those founders that uh, put a lot of money together to build that distribution. You have MD System building that distribution. And now you also have Le Temps, uh, who is using that uh, distribution. What is that distribution? It's a really fully functional news portal distribution, uh, fully built with Drupal 8. 
some features that I'm uh, highlighting here, like publishing all the community, uh, social management, third-party integration with payment gateway. You can do multi-platform, multi-channel. It's um, built with best practice, fully test coverage. It took one year of investment for uh, MD system to actually build that distribution. They have contributed 42 modules. They have ported a lot of modules to Drupal 8 in order for that distribution to be built. Uh, they have packaged 15 custom modules and features that are inside the distribution. Uh, and they have a shit ton of uh, scenarios for, um, for the test, for, uh, for BHAT. I'm sure you've heard about BHAT. It's a big investment. If you're a company like MD System and you decide to put all your power to actually switch to Drupal 8 before Drupal 8 was actually released, it's kind of a big investment. This thing with the distribution, and it's a, you're going to tell me that it's a bit weird. Uh, you, if you want to use it, you have to pay a buy-in fee. Okay, but you're going to tell me that license with Drupal is GPL, so I'm, I get to also give the source code with the distribution. That's where the fair partnership policy come into uh, account. If you put a lot of money to actually use the distribution for all your websites, you're not going to uh, automatically share it for free. You're going to also be able to resell it. Uh, so if you want to actually use that distribution or at least test the distribution, you can uh, either come to our booth at platform.sh and we're going to be able to uh, put you in contact or you can directly contact MD system and they're going to figure that out for you. What are the tools that they are actually using um, for those big websites. So the first one, of course, is the CMS. It's Drupal 8. Why have they chosen Drupal 8? For some specific obvious reason, like the, Wiz the WYSIWYG, the new inline editing, which is very uh, important for all their, um, how do you call that, marketing people or the people writing the news, the reporters. Uh, but also what uh, they just talked about with, uh, with Fastly, the new caching system for Drupal 8 um, and the services integration that, made, that were made super easy with Drupal 8. The new caching system is super important for them, um, and I'm going to talk about Fastly right now. No, ah, into slide, okay. Uh, we're going to come back to Fastly. Um, also, the hosting. Uh, they have chosen platform.sh for all of their, um, uh, to host all of their websites. One of the big reasons was the high availability. They wanted to be able to deploy major feature all the time without putting the site down. That's what we propose with Platform of SH. We have triple redundancy for all of your service, which means like if we do, uh, if you want to do a down um, upgrade, upsize or downsize of your service, you're expecting some uh, big traffic because you're on TV or something or you have breaking news, you want to be able to very quickly without any downtime uh, upscale, ups uh, upsize the resources that are serving your website. And also it's a 100% Git-based development workflow, so you can uh, use uh, multiple applications inside the same repo and uh, some modules, that's what they're using. Uh, and we also had uh, very early uh, support for Drupal 8, which uh, was important also for them. The CDN, uh, that's a big um, coincidence that they just talked about Fastly. You already know everything about it. Uh, I still want to mention that it's a pretty cool uh, solution because of the instant purging and propagation of updates. I'm not sure if you've ever used the CDN, I'm not going to give uh, any name, but you know that if you do a change in the configuration, it can take hours to actually see the change in some node somewhere. And if you're testing your configuration, or if you've done a mistake, you don't want to wait four more hours to actually get uh, that fixed, right? And um, instant purging is pretty interesting. And also the key-based purging that they just presented. So the reflection is that, um, and I think that's my last slide, yeah, the reflection is behind that, is that a good idea to actually build a distribution so that it can serve multiple purposes and it can um, serve all your, cli your clients' needs? If you have multiple projects, that might be a good idea and Drupal 8 makes it easy now. Thank you very much, that's a bit less than 50 minutes. Uh, if you have any question, I'm more than happy to answer them. Do you use features as features module or only CMI? Uh, I think they use only CMI, but since uh, they sent me the, the number of features, they might have some features. But I'd say it's only CMI, but you can check. Any other question? All right, thank you very much. I think that's the next one, yeah.
Oh, yeah. That, that was one question I had, too, if you want to answer yeah, real the quick. The so what's the story behind the astronaut? Um, our motto is now deployed to the moon. Um, we are behind platform.sh, and we think we can deploy your application everywhere, and the last, next logical step would be to deploy your application to the moon. So we are already working on that. The moon cache context, that's a good idea. I think it's going to be hard to get uh, instant invalidation. Um, I don't know what the round trips are all the way to the moon, but uh, that, one's, that one's kind of far. Um, all right. Um, I, I think we've been doing a blistering pace here so far. We've had at least one talk that was condensed down from 45 minutes. So this is probably the best like value per minute of any session, uh, I would say because uh, we're, we're already at over one hour. Um, so, in, in effective time. Um, so, um, uh, uh, my name is Dan Kiebrick. I'm gonna be talking about um, distributed tracing for performance monitoring in Drupal-based applications. Um, uh, I did notice a trend in the first two talks. I'm just gonna get this out of the way at the beginning. Uh, disappointingly, there are no references to space in this entire in this entire talk. And in fact, the outline um, is, is here, and, and that kind of proves that. Um, I'm going to introduce and motivate uh, distributed tracing, kind of ex explain what it is and why, um, why I started to care about it a couple of years ago and um, why you might as well. Uh, talk about some different approaches to it. Uh, I think a lot of this will be motivated by uh, some of the work that I've been doing for the last couple of years with AppNeta, but there are uh, open source tools, uh, you know, different types of uh, approaches for it, and it's pretty interesting. And then I'll talk about some of the challenges that you know, we face when we try to introspect applications this way and um, some future directions that, that it might head. So um, where this journey started for me uh, was in 2008. I was working uh, for a uh, website, a company called uh, amystreet.com. Um, and you probably haven't heard of them because they were competing with the iTunes store. And um, the goal was to sell uh, independent music online with demand-based pricing. And this was kind of a cool idea that if people uh, hadn't really downloaded something much, if it wasn't that popular, it would be cheaper, which would incentivize you to, um, to buy it. And what this meant, um, you know, it turns out is you need all these kind of, you know, crazy features to support that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Amy Street eventually became uh, Songzo, which became uh, Google Play Music. So there's maybe some small part of this still surviving, but I, I, I think it's probably changed quite a bit since then. And um, I had a really good time working there because um, all the people that I worked with were um, smarter than me and very adventurous. And so um, we built a pretty cool application. Uh, it started as a PHP-based um, kind of monolithic web application, LAMP stack, uh, like you do. And then uh, pretty soon we wanted to have search. Uh, and so uh, search, uh, you don't want to do full text search in the database, so you use something Lucene-based, now say Solar. Um, back then it was something that was Lucene-based that um, you know, one of the engineers on the team had made. Um, the dynamic pricing, that's an interesting one uh, because you kind of want to maintain state based on what pages people have seen. So let's say that uh, a new album drops on Tuesday like they do and you go there and you see a price and it says this is only going to be 10 cents per track. And so you listen to a couple of the tracks and you hit buy and it says, oh, you got charged a dollar a track. And oh, what? that's not fair. Well, uh, what happened was during the time that you were listening to, you know, deciding whether you want to buy that album, the prices went up and so, sorry, you know, it's stateless, the web's stateless. Okay, so what we need is a pricing service that gives you a little ticket based on what you've seen and remembers that you've seen that and keeps it around for a certain amount of time. And um, you could probably do this in a relational database. Um, again, we had some, you know, pretty, uh, I, I had some really uh, smart and interesting coworkers and so this was written in Erlang using the um, Amnesia uh, kind of, you know, in-memory database. and again, communicating over um, Facebook thrift, uh, now Apache thrift, um, you know, to talk between languages. And so pretty soon there was just more and more uh, cool services that built up around PHP. And so it's like um, this, this kind of whole tree of things. And I actually have a little map here. And so um, this is also heavily influenced by like the, uh, like the live journal stacks, so you know, Brad Fitz stuff. So we're running Perlbal and Memcache. And there was actually Moga LFS um, to serve, you know, all the MP3s and stuff. And so we had this kind of topology that looked like this, and um, it's really fun to work on. I mean, you know, to, to get paid to write Erlang code, that's, that's hard to do. Um, and so, uh, at least for consumer web. And so, um, this, I told you this was like 2008 uh, timeframe, and it's been almost a decade. And so you might wonder, like, you know, why 
Um, why does he remember this so well? That's kind of creepy, and my memory is actually not that good. The answer is uh, PTSD. Um, so I got a promotion, uh, what I considered an awesome promotion, to the ops team um, while I worked there. And what I started to realize is actually, like, some of these uh, awesome ideas that we had were, like, a little bit weird uh, to have to maintain. And uh, we had an actual colo, and it was much cleaner than this, but that's not how it felt when there was a problem, because um, this is what we had. So we weren't flying blind. Um, using ganglia like you might use, um, uh, you know, for kind of monitoring infrastructure, um, you know, basic uh, health metrics, now gives for alerting. Uh, based on our thrift services, we started to realize, and this is a problem I'll talk about more in a second, that when things can go wrong in all these different um, processes, it's good to have a way to query their health. And so we make a health endpoint, and then we made a web page that would query all the different health endpoints, and then you could have Nagios hit that and grab for whether the text looked good or bad. Um, and there were, of course, lots of logs, and every process on every machine had logs. And so this is kind of what the uh, debug workflow looked like. Um, and the story version of it is, say, Elliot, one of the non-technical founders of the company, runs into the room and he says, guys, the website's really slow, or it's white screening. Okay, Elliot, um, you know, do you have any other clues? Well, it happens one in six times. Oh, it's probably one of the app servers. Uh, oh, it happens one in two times. It's probably one of the databases or, you know, one of the pricing servers. So, like, uh, that, that's not really good. Um, uh, if, if that doesn't immediately tip you off or to investigate that, you tail the logs of every service and every machine. So you have, um, you know, you didn't really have um, Splunk. There weren't all these kind of cloud logging things. And so you would have a bash script that would, um, you know, tail all these logs in parallel. Um, maybe you want to check the database process list, SSH, SSH in and poke around. Um, for slow stuff in particular, this was really hard to track down though because maybe it was something about like you're looping over a certain query or a query is taking a long time but not long enough that it's running for like 60 seconds and you catch it. And so you're actually going to insert some logging based on where you think it is and do a new release and, uh, and it takes like a full day to figure out what's going on. Um, and you know, eventually you're just Googling it. And so, um, this worked, you know, it, uh, it, it, it managed to solve the problems, but it wasn't like a super efficient, um, you know, use of time and we'd keep adding uh, more uh, metrics and stuff around common problems. And um, I had some, uh, some coworkers uh, leave and one of them called me up one day and he said, hey, you know, I was looking at this uh, cool academic project called Xtrace and I think we could use it to solve some of the problems that, you know, we had at Amy Street. And, uh, okay, well, you know, what's Xtrace? Well, the idea is if you could just follow all those requests through the application and see what they were doing in each tier, then you could kind of, you know, take that data and it's more structured than logs because you actually be able to map from process to process and if there's concurrency, you know, you'll send a unique identifier through and you'll just associate that with every little bit of data you gather. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, I think, you know, if we got traces of a lot, a lot of requests and then start mining it for data, we could probably figure out what was going on, but that sounds like a lot of work because if you think about what you'd want, um, let's imagine that each one of these kind of red dots is like an instrumentation point, say. We'd want to see when the request, you know, comes into our application, maybe even, you know, in Perlval in our kind of previous example or Nginx, um, you know, maybe like people would use today. Um, and then when it gets handed off to the application, then maybe some stuff inside the application code, and then whenever it makes a call out to an external service, and this is going to be a lot of work uh, because we're going to have to add all these instrumentation points. So um, the approach we ended up taking was basically that, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it works. Um, I want to actually show some examples first to make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, and so uh, what I want to show is actually based on kind of what we've done at Epneta and also uh, a uh, TraceView Drupal module that was um, written by some people that use our software uh, who wanted to kind of, you know, take it and add uh, more data that's specific to, say, um, you know, different uh, hooks in Drupal 7. And we actually have a, a, a Drupal 8 uh, port of this in, in beta right now that starts to look into some of that um, stuff. I, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, if not, I took some screenshots of it, but if the internet is not like super bad, then we can actually just, um, <sighs> it's always harder to type when someone's watching. So uh, I, I thought maybe we could just walk through one of these uh, and, um, and, and, and look at like an actual trace. And just to kind of map it to what we just saw, behind the scenes we're collecting all these different events and they're kind of in like a graph. So we attach this unique identifier at the top level and we propagate it around and we have all these events that we generated and 
In this case, it's pretty linear. Um, there isn't um, kind of any, any uh, fan out or anything crazy going on. Uh, but what we do have here is a, uh, a web request that's being handled by a demo Drupal 8 um, application that we have set up. And it's a pretty, pretty simple request. Uh, it's just coming for a URL called slash trace view. Uh, and uh, it's from earlier this morning. I picked it out because it had a, a nice little structure here. We've got some kind of summary notes about it. But um, the interesting thing is the path of that request through the application. Because this took a second and a half. And I'm not super impressed with that performance. So I wonder, hey, you know, what, what's it doing during that time? And uh, from left to right, we've got the timeline of the request. And from top to bottom is kind of like where we were in the execution. So the critical path is really this thing along the bottom. If you are used to looking at like front end web performance and like a waterfall chart, then we might think about it more this way. And so we've got kind of, you know, we spent a lot of time in, you know, HTTP kernel master request, a fair amount of time in rendering the views themselves. Um, so we'll dig into that. This view is a little bit more compact, so it's nicer for kind of projecting here. And if we're just stepping through this, the request starts off being handled by, um, you know, the Apache web server here. It's not doing much work. It's just passing that request along, you know, basically proxying it through to uh, PHP, which is where we actually start to, you know, get into stuff we probably care about. Uh, we've actually also done our first distributed system thing, which is uh, potentially go from process to process. And as we start to walk through this, the application code uh, begins to... Oh. There's a spaceship outside. That's the finale. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the, the, the first kind of interesting thing that we're doing here in our bootstrapping is uh, set names UTF-8. That's actually not that interesting. And then the second thing is not that interesting either. So we've got these queries very, you know, fast, like, you know, 200 microsecond queries. They're running against a database. And, you know, if we see where this is coming from, we're still, you know, in the bootstrap. And uh, zooming out a little bit, we see there actually is maybe a little bit less than 100 um, you know, milliseconds of kind of bootstrapping stuff before we actually get into the uh, master request handling stuff and um, you know, start, start running this. And I got the, the five minute warning. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep a pretty blistering pace. Uh, a lot of this request handling uh, you know, latency actually happens inside um, you know, rendering our views here. And uh, in particular, you know, we can see maybe what uh, different um, you know, twig templates are taking a long time, and what kind of view subcomponents those are, um, those are those are pulling out as well. What you know, database queries get involved in um, this particular theme. Um, so you know, pulling the settings for that. Um, you know, the uh, the nice thing about this second and a half um, page load, by the way, is hopefully we're running varnish in front of it or a CDN even on top of that, uh, so that we like we we have this kind of like Russian uh, nesting dolls type setup, so that we never have to actually generate these pages. Um, but, you know, when we do, we want them to be very performant so they scale well. And so being able to break this down is kind of um, interesting. Here's something else I saw that I thought was super weird. We've got um, some latency in Apache uh, after PHP is done. Like, that's kind of weird. I think what it is in this case, um, the, we're generating traffic from an Australian data center to request pages here. And so that could actually just be downloading our kind of our big heavy page here um, for that last uh, 100 milliseconds or so across that. Across that internet, we can't break the speed of light. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go back to the slides now. Um, and uh, I also had a Drupal 7 request here. It's, you know, pretty similar. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, bootstrapping. In this case, there's something super weird, which is we're using memcache, but memcache is being super slow when we talk to it. So that's not, that's not the most exciting thing in the world um, to see. Uh, this is Drupal 7, so we're seeing kind of different um, you know, structure as far as how the CMS is, um, you know, evaluating uh, different parts of it. It's actually using views as well. Um, now, it, this was like what I would call um, minimally distributed, right? A LAMP stack is basically the, uh, the smallest level of, um, you know, actually uh, interactive application we have on the internet. There's a lot of static sites now, but uh, I'm not counting those. Uh, when we start to get into a more complex application, this is, again, getting back to my Amy Street use case, then it becomes a little bit more compelling. And so to give an example of that, um, let's say that I'm making a curl call to this, um, you know, particular service, and maybe that's like some payment processor, and in that case, if it takes a second like this, then I just say, okay, well, I'll try to not do that too often, uh, or that's the cost of making money. But uh, maybe it's to an internal service tier or, uh, you know, search service, and so I might actually want to be able to figure out what happened during the processing of that request. And so with distributed tracing, I could actually kind of jump across the wire there and, and see what's going on there. Now, 
Uh, while we were working on this, uh, just because we happened to read this paper, we weren't the only ones. Um, Google was working on it because they're ahead of everybody on everything. Um, Twitter ended up open sourcing something that they used for this called uh, Twitter Zipkin. Etsy talked about doing something similar to this in 2014. Right now I'm working on a project with some people called Open Tracing that's, um, that's, that's kind of starting to plant the seeds for this. Um, there's some commercial offerings like, um, you know, my company, uh, as well as some that are, you know, uh, for application performance monitoring, maybe not as oriented around uh, distributed. Um, I wanted to talk through some of the really interesting challenges related to this, but I don't want to run over. Um, so instead, the slides for this will be available. Um, and uh, I will be around afterwards in case anybody wants to talk. So uh, thank you. I found the thank you slide, and uh, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, any questions? All right. Well, thanks, though. And thanks for sharing the laptop. Thank you. It's full screen enough. All right, everybody, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the risks of going headless. Uh, a lot of people have done a lot of really technical sessions about this subject, so if you're interested in the technical details of going headless, this isn't the talk for you. I'm going to be talking from my perspective. So about me, um, that's what I look like. My name's Mark Faree. I'm the director of engineering at Chapter 3. So I manage a lot of developers. I've got my fingers in every one of our projects. And so I'm going to be talking about um, what I've seen go well and what I've seen go wrong and how we try to manage that with a couple of headless projects that we've worked on. Um, and if you want to talk to me, uh, MRF on pretty much everything where you can find me. So a little bit of background, um, high-level overview of what headless means. Um, Thank you, Dries, for preparing this diagram for me. Um, so, so this does a really good job of explaining what is called headless or decoupled and sort of what that relationship is you know, to your Drupal site. So um, if you look at this diagram, um, you know, you've got your traditional Drupal site on the left-hand side. And, and that means Drupal going all the way back to, I don't know, you know, Drupal 4 is when I got involved, and it looked just like this then. And you know, Drupal 8, if you use it out of the box, is also exactly the same. And what this means is that your theme layer is tightly coupled to your system. Like e everything that Drupal does assumes the theme layer is going to be there and you're relying on that theme layer. And so what that means is you need to be a Drupal expert in order to wrangle this whole system. So um, if you want to work in the front end, you need to know a lot about what the back end's doing it and why it's doing it. I've, I've found the best you know, front-end developers in Drupal also are really good site builders. You know, they know how to build views, they understand the data structures, and they understand you know, why Drupal is doing what it is on the theme layer. Like sometimes that theme layer can be a little bit impenetrable. It's, you know, it's like an area of expertise. So you know, uh, one solution that people have come up to this, you know, they've seen this as a problem. It's, it's, it's hard for Drupal if you have to be such an expert in order to you know, make it look beautiful. So they've decided to you know, hack off the entire visual side of the site and call it um, headless or decoupled. And so the, the example on the right is the front end no longer has any you know, tight relationship to the back end. Y your front end is just going to make API calls or s use some other method to pull the data it needs out of Drupal. And so the reason this is called you know, the managing the risks of headless is all of a sudden you've you know, made your project a lot more complex. Um, so step one is you know, distributed teams. So what we've just said is that you know, our, our Drupal team doesn't actually need to build the whole site. We've just introduced the possibility of bringing in an outside contractor or you know, a team of Angular devs that happens to work at the same company to build the entire front end. Um, they probably don't know anything about Drupal and they might not have any desire to learn anything about Drupal. So all of a sudden, from my perspective, it's, we've introduced a potential communication problem. They, we, we need them to clearly describe what they want, how they want it formed, how they want it structured, 
And they need to ask those questions in a way that makes sense to a Drupal developer, even if the data structures they're describing don't really map well onto Drupal. So you know, we all of a sudden have these difficult conversations that we've inserted into the equation, which is, why can't you expose it to me this way? It's like, well, it's hard. Well, why is it hard? You, know, you have to explain 2 thirds of Drupal in order to explain why it's hard. So right there, we just introduced a risk for a project, because you know, you know, clients and end users, they care about how it works and how it functions on the front end. And you know they don't really care that you know this layer of complexity is there or not. Like all, all they all they want is a fast, beautiful experience on the front end. So um, you should think about what your team looks like. Uh, a lot of the big success stories I've seen and I've heard from are where you get either ex Drupal developers that have learned a, a framework and have done the front end, or you have people on the same team. So they're in the same office. They can throw a pencil across the room when they have a question. That seems to sort this out, but I've seen when you have distributed teams or teams from two different companies that this can get really tricky really fast. Um, duplicate functionality. So um, made this one myself. I'm not the best at building graphs, as you can tell. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things Drupal can do, and there's a lot of things your front-end framework can do. And um, what, what you realize is um, both systems are actually doing the same things. You know, Drupal has a templating engine. Drupal has, in, in Drupal 8, a really awesome cache layer. You know, Drupal has a lot of things that your, your front-end framework of choice is also going to have. So you really need to start asking yourself, is why, why am I not using native Drupal? Like, what's, what's the business need? What's the technical need? Like, what, what is my strong motivation for this project? And, you know, there's a lot of reasons you, you, you would want to go headless. You know, maybe you're sending the API out to four different sources. Like, a really good way to test an API, you know, that you're building is, you know, try to, try to make, build the entire site off of that API. Because then, you know, if somebody's building an iPhone app off of it, if you're distributing that API for external devs to use, you know it's really solid because it builds your entire front end. So it has everything there that anybody would possibly need. So that's a really good reason to go headless. Um, maybe it is the structure of your existing team. Maybe you don't want to hire front-end Drupal devs. Maybe you don't have any front-end Drupal devs. You just got one Drupal back-end guy that doesn't know, you know CSS from a hole in the wall. So you know, he, he, want, he wants to still build the back-end in Drupal, you know, and, you, he, and he can say, I'll, I'll, I'll get the Angular team anything they need. They just need to let me know, and I'll make it happen. So Drupal still gets to be part of the equation. But, you, but you really, if, if you're a Drupal shop and you're looking at a headless project, you really need to think, like, what benefit is this bringing my client? You know, like, what are they getting from chopping off the head? Um, and we've just added a new layer of abstraction. I was going into that a little bit in the previous, you know, examples, but um, the only, you know, the worst kind of abstraction is unnecessary abstraction. So, you know, right here, we've just created a... Um, you know, a, a layer where, you know, we actually have to think about everything we're serving up and how we're serving it up. Um, did we think about, you know, caching those requests? You know, we just heard a lot about Fastly and these distributed architectures, like um, what happens to my front end when Drupal can't serve my request fast enough? Like all of a sudden, Drupal is slowing down my awesome Node.js front end because the requests aren't getting served fast enough. So your server architecture just got more complicated. I hope you have a systems team and um, your whole project just got a lot more complicated. Um, you also introduced a single point of failure. So this, this graphic's getting a lot of use in this presentation. So right here, this gap can be the size of the Grand Canyon. You know, so you, you, have, you introduced communication issues. You introduced a whole spec that needs to be written, which is you know, what needs to be exposed out of Drupal to this other application. You know, D8 makes some assumptions there. There's a couple of different modules you can use for D7 that do this really well, but they all make their own set of assumptions, and those may be entirely wildly different than what your front-end team is expecting to see. So are you prepared to actually go and build exactly what they want? Are you prepared to go negotiate with them to convince them that what Drupal sends out by default is what they actually need? So, you know, so you, you've got a new single point of failure, and you know, if that caching layer goes down, you might stop serving content to your front end. Like, you know, and that's, and that's, not, that's another reason why you, you want to avoid a single point of failure. So um, th there's been a lot said about headless. You know, I, I wrote a blog post about this. Um, so decapitated Drupal, you just need to enter, enter that into Google, and I'm number one for that. 
You know, I, I, I was just, I feel like um, there are really good, really strong reasons why you would want to build a headless site, but I feel like the main motivation I, I see for a lot of headless projects is it's shiny. It's like, I want to learn a Node.js framework, my team wants to learn a Node.js framework, and this is a way to have your cake and eat it too. I can still build Drupal, and I can, I can introduce Node.js. Like, that should be the, the furthest from your mind and from your team's mind in terms of why you're building a headless project. You need to have a real business driver, a real like strong need in your organization for why this thing needs to be lopped off because all those risks you just introduced are gonna cause pain down the road. Um, Dries wrote a much more measured approach. I think he's a little bit more excited about headless projects than I am. So um, if, if you want sort of a more balanced perspective, like his blog posts goes into a lot of detail and he has a whole series of blog posts where he was talking about you know, his pers perspective on headless. Um, I would also, like anything written by Four Kitchens, they have a really good team. Like they have Angular devs that work there and, and they're longtime Drupal guys as well. So, you know, they have a lot of really good resources on, you know, how to do headless right and how to avoid some of these pitfalls that you're gonna d definitely run across. So that's it for me. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, all right. Um, come grab me at the booth if you have any questions later. Yeah, and just, just one more thing. Um, uh, John Alban is actually currently um, uh, um, addressing this need kind of that you need to learn Drupal themes and the whole theme component system that we're building at the moment. Uh, that will allow also kind of having a team that's not knowing the Drupal theme layer but a different theme layer to build themes uh, without having to deal with all that uh, stuff that's so Drupal specific. So. Soon, hopefully, there will be one less reason to go headless.